Hi, I'm John Valentino with John and Bob's, and uh, I'm here with Chip. Um, we're uh, landscape architects and landscape contractors, and we're at an interesting site that has been using our John and Bob's uh, blend, the, the combination of optimized, maximized, nourished biosol, for about four or five years now, specifically on citrus and some other fruit trees. And so we're going to look at the citrus that he grows here, talk about his um, his techniques, his care techniques, and um, talk a little bit about how useful citrus are in gardens. Welcome to our YouTube channel. Chip and I plan to be doing a lot more uh, videos for you. If you like them, please click on like and click on subscribe and click on the bell so that you'll be notified every Sunday when we uh, post our new videos. So in the landscape, citrus are extremely useful because they are evergreen, easy to grow, bear a lot, has some kind of fruit on it, a whole array of types of fruit, depending on which one you select. We'll talk about that a little. And comes in different sizes so that it doesn't get too big for its spot. You can get them in semi-dwarf and dwarf. And uh, so they're very useful as backgrounds, as evergreen screens and as um, producers of delicious uh, fruit. What the owner has done here is plant full-size citrus and he prunes them very aggressively. So they've been in probably seven, eight years and yet you won't see any that are very tall because he's aggressively pruning them down. Um, there's, they take to pruning very well. His uh, reasoning is he wants to be able to harvest them all and he's not really that concerned about size of crop or the number of um, citrus that he can pick, but he wants access to them. He wants them to be easy to pick and so he says by pruning them that way his family is able to consume all the fruit produced on all of these trees uh, except the lemons which outproduce him a little. Um, so has to give some of those away. but. Um, so they, they take to pruning very well. You can control uh, the size. I have some in my front yard that I'm keeping at six feet tall and they adapt to that and they still uh, produce well. The neat thing about citrus, um, whether you pick dwarf or full size or semi dwarf, is there's such a range of um, specific ones you can pick to, to where you wouldn't get too many of one thing. This owner has many of them right here and in some interesting varieties and we'll look uh, specifically at those right now. The one I'm standing in front of is uh, a Caracara navel orange. It's a type of navel orange called Caracara. It has a beautiful um, pinkish reddish blush to it when you um, peel it and look on the inside. One of my favorite uh, mandarin oranges is an old-fashioned one that uh, peels very easy and usually has no seeds and it's called Owari Satsuma mandarin orange and this is it and uh, it is one of the first to ripen so it ripens very early usually in early November even late October in our area and uh, really a great uh, but kind of old-fashioned not many current ag growers grow it because it's considered old-fashioned, but it's one of the best. This is a navel orange called Fukumoto, which is planted because it ripens very early. And so it's an early ripening uh, navel orange that produces uh, delicious uh, navel oranges. This is an Oro Blanca grapefruit, so more of a traditional grapefruit that you, white grapefruit that you might buy in the store, um, and uh, produces lots of grapefruit. I think I've had this one, a few from this one too. Fantastic, really dense, really juicy really high quality fruit. As I said, lemons are one of the biggest citrus. This is um, a, a lemon and it's a seedless lemon, which is hard to find, but quite in demand. And he has three of them on site here, the seedless lemons. The lemons are fantastic, full of juice and growing like crazy. The other citrus that's a very small grower is the lime. Both uh, the Mexican lime and the bear's lime, the plants are small. This is a bear's lime, which is my favorite. That's more of a, a traditional lime that looks very green on the inside. The Mexican lime is the lime that's used on a lot of drinks, particularly in Mexico, but it looks more like a small lemon. It, it doesn't even, sometimes they don't even look green on the outside. Whereas the bear's lime 
is very green on the outside and the inside, full of juice. And you can see it's only four or five feet tall, probably even a full-size bear's lime is, only gets about seven to eight feet tall. This is a Meyer lemon, which the fruit doesn't really even look like a lemon or act like a lemon. It's much milder, not as acidic. Uh, Meyer lemon also is quite a bit smaller than, say, a Eureka or the other varieties of lemon, um, like I showed you the seedless one. Um, Meyer lemon is a much smaller tree. This is a, a new variety, well, relatively new variety of mandarin orange called Tango, and Tango ripens very late. Um, I've had, I've tasted from this very tree. They're really tremendous, but you have to wait for them. Whereas the uh, Owari Satsuma ripens in November, the um, Tango is much, much later. I, I'd say January or February. So this one is a star ruby grapefruit. In other words, a pink grapefruit. And um, there's still a few on the tree, which is tough to do to be picking in uh, August. Uh, we're filming this in uh, mid-August and there's still three or four on the tree. They're very delicious, full of color, full of juice. So this is the Washington navel, uh, most commonly grown uh, navel in California. And I showed you the Fukumoto um, navel orange, which is grown to get an early, earlier ripening. Washington navel ripens usually late um, November and early December, and then can stay on the tree all the way till April or May. Citrus likes well-drained soil, a little on the light side. This is very heavy clay-like soil, and this is an area of town that has hard pan. And uh, so what we've done to get this um, citrus to perform at its best and produce at a top level is um, the owner has made uh, twice per year applications of our blend, which is optimized, maximized, nourished biosol, uh, about um, six cups uh, per tree uh, in the spring and six cups per tree in the fall. And um, the effect of that is multidimensional. One thing, uh, obviously, we have macro and micronutrients in that, so it feeds the, the trees themselves. But really what we're after here is feeding and changing the soil and making that soil alive with all kinds of beneficial um, microbial life. If you can make soil alive with that kind of life, it will change everything about the soil, in, in, including the heaviness of it and the porosity of it. So we want to improve the drainage here, which we have done over the years by those continued uh, applications. The other thing it, that's interesting that it does, I'll cover more in the next topic, but um, when you uh, improve soil like that with life, it addresses uh, both um, heat tolerance and cold tolerance. So over the years now, we're in our, about our fifth year of uh, application of uh, blend, um, we have a completely different soil than we started with, and it's actually very well suited to citrus, pretty well draining, although it's still a little on the heavy side, and uh, full of uh, life, and that life uh, feeds the soil in a way that it um, gives the trees ways to fight against all pests and diseases. So what we're trying to do is feed it in a way that you end up with self-sustaining citrus, not ones that you have to be out spraying, spraying for scale and mite and all of the things that can plague citrus. In the home garden, since your livelihood is not dependent on the fruit, I think it's better to relax a little bit about frost protection. Hopefully you're in an area that um, is where citrus grow. And if you're in an area where citrus grow, my own recommendation would, would be to not go to any special work to try to protect them from frost. The main thing I would recommend to protect them to frost, which I alluded to in the last segment, is to build up that soil with beneficial life. That'll actually get you a degree or two antifreeze, essentially antifreeze, um, that'll help um, when cold weather arrives um, that allows the soil to help the plant um, deal with that cold weather. So I'd focus on soil health uh, as the main way you address cold weather and frost. Um, you see a lot of people covering with garments and such. It's not a good idea, although I see it a lot, to grate plastic over, um, over citrus. That's actually not good for the citrus. 
Uh, the one thing, you could build a little structure over your citrus. Um, in this area, we have what's called convection frost, meaning all of the heat on a cold day that you can look in the sky and there's no clouds or no cloud cover. It's not a rainy day. It's a completely clear day. And that heat just leaves the surface and goes straight up into the atmosphere. If you put some type of cover, but um, not touching the leaves uh, is the best way to do it. Um, it will, when that heat leaves, you'll create a little bit of a greenhouse there. So that is something you could do. I don't recommend it because it's a lot of trouble. And usually frost will damage the fruit, but it won't damage um, the tree itself. The, if you do want to just drape something over it, there is a, a fabric made for that purpose, but it has to be specifically for that purpose. It's a very sheer fabric. Uh, that's a frost control fabric. You can find it online and you could just drape that over the plant and that works kind of creating that greenhouse effect a little bit. Uh, but don't use plastic. That's actually defeats the purpose. So relax about frost, grow healthy plants, infuse that soil with life. And uh, when frost comes, I don't think you'll have a problem. Hey there, friends. Thanks for watching our video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click on the bell. If you enjoyed this video, have any questions, or just want to say hi, let us know in the comments below. Want to learn more about our products? Then head over to our website, www.johnandbobs.com.